Hey guys, Taki Cat here. Um, a few quick things. Thank you everyone for all the support on the uh, guide I uploaded on Reddit. Amazing. What we have here is one of two things. One, people wanted highlight reels. As you can see, if we look at my hand, and if we can get rid of that, oh, there we go. Um, we have a Archmage Antonitis. I burgled the turn before, um, and then instantly hit record because people want to see that kind of the power of burgle. Now, what I did, because I'm, again, a genius, is I made a bunch of tech choices, I put this on ladder, I decided I'd record the games, and I didn't turn my microphone on. And I spent 40 minutes talking through every single play, doing a really amazing commentary, I opened up the edit and realized it was muted. So what we have instead now is me post-recording, quite frustrated, and I'm going to talk over the games, and hopefully it kind of evens out, and I'm gonna be trying to second guess my plays but it should be an interesting experience nonetheless, and this should hopefully give you some idea of how, you know, I pilot this deck. A few other things I will quickly mention. Um, I made some fairly large alterations to the deck. Someone uh, said, what would you replace Gallywix for? And I was like, well, you can't replace him, blah, 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 blah. I guess if you had to, you'd probably go for a Toshley. Um, because it's an equal body, and then suddenly I was like, why have I never tried Toshley instead of Sylvanas? I find Sylvanas a weak slot. I love having the stronger body. Toshley has synergy with the spare parts with Star Seeker. He has synergy with bouncing back mechanics. He can freeze, he can taunt, he's great, let's try him. In the five games, I know it's not much, but in the five games that I tried him out, I think I actually will keep him in that slot. It will make the Priest matchup slightly worse because of Sylvanas, but also stronger because they struggle clearing stuff with more health than attack. Part of the reason I made this list with lots of 3-5s was just to hard counter Light Bomb. That plays into that strategy even more. So I'll keep testing it and maybe update the guy, but that's one change. I then made two other changes. One of them I'm going to revert. I cut one fast here for a second BGH. Um, people said that they were struggling in Secret Power, then they thought that maybe a second BGH would help. I personally didn't really find that the case, but I thought I'd try it anyway. Um, I actually found that while it worked, I went 4-1, um, and one, I believe, out of those five games. Um, while it worked, I prefer having the faster. I much prefer um, being able to play the BGH on curve. It just not the BGH, the faster on curve. So I'm going to stick back to one faster, one BGH. And the second change was I cut one um, burgle for one skulker. Right, so minus one Burgle, minus one Farsim, minus one Sylvanas, plus one BGH, plus one Skulker, plus one Toshley. The Toshley change probably staying. The um, Farsa change, as I said, I'm going back to Farsa because I, it's something I did in the past and I found it too greedy and I was like, I need the healing. And then I tried it again, it's like, yeah, no, I need the extra healing. And the Burgle for. Skulker actually kind of like, because there's a lot of zoo on the meta at the moment, and there's a lot of Paladin, it makes the Paladin match up even better. Anyway, that's kind of a really exhaustive list, we're going to go jump into the games now, and this should be interesting. Okay, so, what we have <laughs> here, um, begin with, is I'm thinking about my play and I'm also talking over sort of what's kind of going on. So, I'm just trying to stay on curve, and that's why I just threw that out there. Um, a few things that I will say in retrospect is the reason why I didn't just play the Trade Prince to stay on curve is I hadn't seen the Flame Wakers yet and I hadn't seen the Archmage. Because of that I generally do not like playing Gallywix beforehand. Now interestingly enough I end up playing the Gallywix later on before dealing with all the threats just because I drew kind of poorly. Um, and it kind of worked out for me so in retrospect I probably would have been better off playing the Trade Prince on Curve, but it could have gone terribly, terribly wrong this early into the game. And I stand by just playing the um, Nexus. Now you saw the Nexus didn't last very long, it just sort of took the Fireball and lost. Um, well, I say lost, it didn't get any value. The reason why that's fine is that you don't always play him to get value. You play him as a late game threat which can be played on Curve, right? Um, why do I throw the Abyss right there? I just want to keep the board um, clear. I wanted to set up an Archmage Antonidas play. I wanted to set up a Mirror Entity, definitely for turn 8, in case he ran Rag, because some lists run Rag, some lists run Ronan, um, in case he did like an Archmage Antonidas and a 1-drop, which is also fairly common. Um, so that's kind of all of that and why, you know, I was sort of going for that kind of approach. 
Okay, so I ended up copying a Murloc thanks to the joys of um, Unstable Portal. I would have much rather had something from his deck, but you know, it's kind of good enough. He gets a decent trade, but I can trade back. So, you know, it kind of, it cancels out, you know, my half of half of the burgle dealt with his um, Unstable Portal. That is why it's a value card is, yeah, you don't always get two amazing cards like a Mirror Entity and an Archmage, but you often get like a decent card and a bad card or two good cards or whatever, right? But it's all two cards they need to deal with. They can't just go, oh, he got an extra card, it was bad. They need to kill it. So they either need to trade something into it or use a spell or leave it on board and it wins you the game or, you know, whatever. But does that sort of make sense? So again, I'm just trying to play on curve. Um, I was a bit greedy with the Archmage and I probably would been better off just kind of throwing him down. Um, I did get very greedy with the Archmage and I don't think it nested me any value in the end. But if I did just throw it down, as you can see it went badly. Now, this is the case where you can say, oh having the second BGH was helpful because you definitely had it early on. And that was why I included it, that is the advantage of having two BGH. I don't think this meta calls for 2 BGH, maybe since Life Coach is playing Handlock again people will be flooding back to Warlock and Giants. Um, the main reason I would run 2 is just for the more consistent draw so that I definitely have it on 7. Um, that is the appeal of it. I think the correct choice if you want to run the double BGH is to keep the Farsa in and it would be cut the second Skulker and keep the second BGH. That might be a stronger choice, that might be better in more matchups. I think I prefer having the Skulker just because Zoo is kind of a thing now. And I'm seeing a few Zoo lists not running late game. Like they cap out at 5 mana with like the Doom Guards and the Lothab. A guy very recently posted a like top 15 list and he kind of capped out at the 5 slot. So having t 2 BGH in that matchup would be kind of weak. Although versus most lists there's nearly always one target for it so you know it works. Here I decided to give him a little happy feast just because I mean, who doesn't love seeing a rogue with Archmage, you know? This guy's toast. Give me one quick second. Still a bit ill, so, you know, if I pause and you notice a weird edit, it's because I was sneezing. Yeah, anyway. So, plays the Flame Waker. I'm kind of panicking a bit at this point, so I'm like, ooh, is he going to get shenanigans? What's he going to do here? Um, it kind of going ended up going pretty well for me. In general, like, a lot of these games went really well for me. There were two games where I just got completely steamrolled because I curved out poorly. And in both of those games, having the Farseer would have prevented that. Um, but here he'd used the, he, you know, he used a lot of his burn. I didn't get the value out of the Archmage because I didn't get the spells. But you need to remember, that was a Burgle. And it worked fine. As I'm showing there, I'm going through, like, look, I got loads of stuff out of it. It's fine. It cleared his board. He had to use a burn spell. It was chill talk about how when I'm hovering over the deck saying how look he hasn't got much um, the chance he has the arc major not played it yet is pretty low he's burnt through all of his fireballs if we um, look over here you can see we've burnt through the fireballs we've burnt through most of his spells so it's a decent chance we'll be okay um, I'm kind of talking about how if I drew from one half of the deck or the other half comparing lists if you see me like hovering over and things it's generally because at the time I was doing an amazing commentary but again I forgot to turn on the microphone, so ooh. so that's no worries. Um, again, this matchup shows the strengths of Gallywix. If you kind of look at the way he handles it, so he plays the Archmage. I'm like, ooh, this is scary, right? He plays the missiles. I give him a coin. He uses the coin. I get a missiles. Now he got an extra fireball because I played the Gallywix, but I got the missiles. The missiles set up um, a very interesting play, well not interesting, it set up a nice play, um, which secured the trades. If I didn't have that and I played a different 6 drop, I wouldn't have had such a clean trade. Also, he wouldn't have a fireball. But, I'm at 15 life, he's used his other fireballs, I'm not afraid of getting killed. Again, I go a little BM there. Um, bit mean of me but at times you need to have fun and I just start armoring up um, another thing for people who are saying this deck doesn't have burn or it doesn't have lasting power the Finley is there so that you can get the early value out of your rogue hero power you then swap your hero power for something which is what you need 
Do you need more burn? Do you need to pressure down your opponent? Go for Hunter, go for Mage, go for Druid. Um, the advantage of going Mage to get White and you just keep the Rogue is that you can use it to ping down face. Um, you can get past Taunt, which is quite big versus Warlock. Um, and you can also use it to f trade more favorably without taking the face damage. So he got the extra fireball, right? Let's just appreciate that. He got the extra fireball, which he used to clear. And then I got a fireball. So it just it's a good card versus mages. He had Antonitis. I played a Gallywix. He got value out of my Gallywix. I still ended up with more value. It's a good card, even in the worst case. Just run Gallywix in your list. It's a card. It works. So let's see what does he do now. He gets to cheat his mana curve. He killed my 2-drop, right? Um, worst case scenario, he would have got to kill something slightly bigger. Yeah, okay, eSports, he plays this, which is ridiculous. I'm like, oh, I really hope I draw into a BGH. It was chill. I just sort of draw. The reason why I drew there was in case of getting a BGH, I'd maybe get an answer. Um, I'm now pretty excited at this point when I got the reversing switch. I'm like, wow, I can set up a really cool play, potentially. Potentially. It's kind of hard doing this commentary, by the way. <laughs> doing a post-commentary. I like doing it in WoW, because um, I do like raiding guides, so I can do the fight, then put commentary on top. But you can't... Spoiling a raid fight, you don't really worry about is I'm trying not to spoil plays and turns and like the effects of the RNG, but I'm kind of doing it anyway, so apologies for that again. This is a mess, anyway. Let's go. <laughs> so here I'm talking about how I want to do my trades. Do I want to maybe do some reversing switch and I'll be safe? Again, this is Toshley proving his weight. Now, if it wasn't Toshley, it would have been a Sylvanas. So, if it wasn't the Sylvanas, then we could have traded, maybe gotten it, maybe not. We might have got the Mana Worm. We wouldn't have gotten the Time Rewinder. The Time Rewinder helped secure this game. The reversing switch helped secure this game. That alone is kind of like, hmm, pretty powerful, right? I feel like spare parts in general are undervalued and underappreciated by the community but they offer a lot of value one thing i will say for anyone who's been trying raptor rogue recently is do not run leper gnomes in your raptor rogue run clockwork gnomes clockwork gnomes are amazing they give you spare parts spare parts are good in rogue end of sorry to kind of come across kind of random saying that but in all of my raptor rogue lists i dropped the leper gnomes put in clockwork gnomes and i never want to go to, oh I wish I'd copied that extra two damage. It actually becomes like a decent copy. Okay, so he draws out. That's fine. The Flame Waker is quite scary at this point. I haven't got that much health. He has a lot of like buff potential. He has the spare part definitely coming. Um, but thanks to the reversing switch, I'm able to deal with it. So, you know, that's the power of the spare parts. Another thing I really like about spare parts, and this is something I kind of like about Elise and Burgle in general, and this is why I kind of like Burgle, Elise, Toshley um, in this list, is you cannot play around the opponent's random hand. Yeah, okay, if you're streaming and you're getting sniped, you're getting sniped. Or if you're in a tournament and someone's sniping you that way, but like, you're not meant to be getting sniped. But you cannot play around... When there's a variant, it's it's not as extreme um, with spare parts than it is with Burgle, or it's most extreme versus Elise. With spare parts, you're kind of playing around, okay, it could be one, two, three, four, you know, which one is it going to be? Is it going to be this one? Is it going to be that one? Uh, whereas with playing around class cards, there's the obvious ones, like people might go, oh, he might have gotten a fireball, and I'll play around the fireball. No one ever plays around the fire lance. No one plays around, oh, he might have stolen a fire lance, you know, oh, why, he one-shot my rag? How did that happen, right? It just doesn't happen. Again, with the legendaries, there's so many extreme answers you could be getting. There's never just the one. Um, there's multiple cases. And because of that, it forces your opponent to make sub-optimal plays. Does that make sense? Sorry if I kind of lost the commentary on that last time. I just want to kind of wrap up that point. And that is one of the big, big strengths of this deck. Some people haven't said it, but I've had friends say it is, well, if you share your list, it'll become um, less successful because I was talking to one of my friends like, oh, I'm going to share my list. Like, Don't do that. It's going to nerf it and it'll be terrible because everyone will know what's in it. The success of this list is partly aided by its RNG. 
You cannot play around RNG. It just happens. Um, here, for example, can I play around Effigy? Sort of, not really. Sometimes he'll just Effigy and he could have gotten something which would have won in the game. That time he didn't. You know, it's not something you can really play about and it's what makes Hearthstone a fun game. You can play a super consistent deck, which is 100% consistent, and sometimes I do that, especially... It's basically when Boombots frustrate me, I make a zoo lock with, like, absolutely no RNG at all. I, like, cut implosions, I cut everything. Um, but at the end of the day, this is why we play Hearthstone rather than playing chess. We want the games to be fun, we want them to be interesting. So I re -queue. I said that I would do five games, including the first one, um, just to kind of give a decent idea of how the deck operates how the sort of new tech works, and also to show off some of the exciting moments of it in action, since some people are requesting that, like they were saying, oh, we didn't get to see Gallyworks in action, or we didn't get to see, like, the crazy RNG. That game, I think, is a pretty good example of both of those things. Okay, so here we go for my mulligan. Now, I don't want to keep four drops, um, and I definitely don't want to keep a Sabotage versus a Mage, so I just throw that back and I keep the SI. I always keep the SI in the opening hand, even if going first, because there's a decent chance we'll get a backstab, so comboing him is fine. Playing him on curve is also fine. You could arguably throw him away and just really hard mulligan for, go for your backstabs, zombie chouts, pardon me, and two drops, but it wouldn't be worth. Now, in this particular case, as you may have noticed, I kind of didn't draw very well. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a bad curve. It's just, it happens that way sometimes. Because I cut one Burgle for one Dark Iron, this curve did shift a little bit. Um, it lost some of the flexibility of playing on curve. Some of the flexibility with the Burgle is that when you're floating that loose mana, you can Burgle, making your turns mana efficient. So cutting one Burgle does lose that um, flexibility. So whether or not I keep in the second Skulker instead of a Burgle is something I'm going to have to play with more. Depending on the meta is something I'm going to be changing back and forth, so don't make that as a definitive, like, swap. I would probably recommend the Toshley. Probably. Um, I need to play with it more, but I'm just, I'm getting a very good idea of it working, and in old rogue lists, I've run Toshley and Trade Prince together and been incredibly impressed by them. They're just a really strong, solid pairing, so... I don't know why I hadn't tested that for in this particular list. It's something that I've praised in others. I must have just, you know, passed my mind or something. I don't know. That's why it's also really, really important, by the way, to always be thinking and looking at the mana curve. There's always something you've missed. Again, my commentary is a little weak for some of my plays here because, well, I just drew absolutely terrible. Um, one thing I'm talking about here as well, do I want to be playing the Sludge next turn or do I want to be playing the Sarad? Um, I figured that the whatever 5 drop I play will probably just get fireballed and so a sludge would be slightly better. The reason why a sludge would be slightly better is that at least it leaves a taunt behind. Now you can kind of see how this play went for me and at this point this game is kind of just, you know, it's a dead game. If you draw dead, you draw dead and that's that, but that's why I played the sludge there rather than the next champion if anyone was wondering. This is also the strength of Casino Mage or Tempo Mage, thing, what you want to call it, is if your opponent has a slow opener, you can just RNG them the second the Flame Waker drops, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so we just kind of get beat. have the heal bot here, I'm kind of going, is there anything I can do, could I heal bot, could I clear, basically I'm dead, um, yeah, I got happy feasted, it happens, you know, great so set, just kind of happens that way. Feels bad, man. Feels bad, man. Okay, so we go into a couple more interesting matchups here. Um, 
so you know hopefully I get to do a bit more post commentary commentary I was I kind of went into a small internal monologue there again apologies for the slapdashery of this video okay didn't get that world-class pace either sad man sad Okay, so this is an incredibly favoured matchup. Um, Agro Shami is probably the easiest matchup for this deck. Um, I kind of spent quite a long time deliberating on if I wanted to keep the Antique Heal Bot. Going second, I generally do keep the Heal Bot. However, since I had the Vendor, I figured it'd be better off just to keep the Vendor and throw back the Heal Bot. And that's kind of what I end up doing here. Yeah. Um, I hard keep Eviscerate. The reason why I hard keep Eviscerate and always will versus an Agro Shami is the Trog. Especially if I'm, if I do it, if I'm going first, if I'm going second, then they play it. I just coin eviscerate, and you know you just beat them. He plays it. I coin. I eviscerate as a game. Um, it's also really good against their turn two because you know the three four totems are pretty hard to get through. I was incredibly pleased by this curve, by the way. It looks like a slow start. Gallywix just wins you the aggro show and match. They have no way of handling it. It just wins you the game because they have to throw their burn into it, which gives you burn. Um, another very important factor about Gallywix, just in general, if played early on curve, in drawn out games, people often forget what they gave you and they stop playing around it, just so you're uh, aware of it. Versus Priest, you can often, if you get a healing spell, hold the healing spell and never play it. The reason why I say that is when they then drop down um, their one drops and you're like, oh, I'm going to get a little bit of cheeky card draw. You then drop that circle healing and you mill them for half of the deck and you win the fatigue war. Okay, so it's a pretty sound time from him. He just sort of buffed up his totem, pop face. I decided just to play on curve here because I don't want to hero power. I want to be proactive. I want to be beating down his plays. That's just basically that. Um, my turn 4 is always Refreshment Vendor as well in this scenario, so getting down to the 26 health is perfect. Either Lava Shocks, Boo Hoo, we want him to be using stuff on our minions. We just play more minions than that deck, so, you know, great thing. One thing I will say is the guy piloting the Shammy list was a bit bad. Not so really bad, but he, he was overly defensive. It's clearly someone who was frustrated with the ladder and swapped onto a popular list. You basically just keep going face and never stop going face, and then you pray that you beat them out. He shouldn't have traded that. He figured he was on the back burn, and he planned around trading. You just punch face with that deck. You just always punch face. Sometimes trading is worth, but in general, don't do it. One quick second. Okay. So, here we're looking at a... Tantra coming down. How do you think we're going to handle this play, guys? I think I'm probably going to uh, trade the 3 fine into it. I could have this straight up, but I want to be playing the Gallywix on curve. Because of that, I'm almost 100% certain I just trade the 3 3 into it in Gallywix. Yep. Um, you're going to see how good this card is now. Look at how he handles it. And this is for everyone who says, oh, Gallywix is a bad card. Hmm. So we lightning bolts. Okay. And he lava bursts. So we just saved ourselves eight face damage. Now, even an experienced aggro shaman player, um, they know they can't leave it on board because the way they work is they burn us down. He doesn't have enough mana, and I've got too much health for him to burn me in one turn. He has to do it over like two turns. So we have to clear it, and he doesn't have the minions. So at some point you have to use at least one spell on it. Now at the very worst that is one spell which isn't going face um, and you gain the spells yourself. Now there's a few different plays I could take here. I mostly just wanted to focus on playing on curve. I could have done four, I could have done refreshment vendor, played the fan and traded it with my face. I decided to do undercity undercity van because I wanted to draw into more healing and I also wanted to bait him into trading. Um, because he'd been trading earlier on, I figured if I played those two, he'd probably just trade into them anyway, and that's what he ends up doing. Um, so that judgment call ended up working quite well for me. Again, he really shouldn't be doing that. He should just be going face. Um, I've still got the one charge of my weapon, so I can handle that, no problem. And this is pretty much just a locked out game. Plays the totem go golem, big dealios. Now I make a slight misplay here. 
Um, well, I make a big-ish misplay. Um, I actually missed lethal. Um, now, what often happens when I'm doing my commentaries is I'm focusing far more so on um, the commentary than the game. If I was actually focusing on the game, I would have realized that Eviscerate plus Lava Burst plus Lightning Bolt plus the Dagger is exact lethal. Instead, I heal him and I stall lethal for one turn. Um, it still works, but, you know, don't be doing that. It's bad, man. I actually stalled it by two turns now that I uh, rewatched the play. So, yeah. Don't miss lethal. Um, always count. A trick for just generally new players is when you go through a turn, don't rush it. If you just slowly look from the left to the right of your hand and go, what could I play? Um, if you're ever new to combo decks in general, always be recounting combo. Always be looking at the health and seeing how much more damage do I need to get the lethal. Um, quickly to talk over why I did the trades I did. You're saying, why didn't you use your face dagger then? Um, the only way he can win this game is by bursting me with some kind of double crackle for seven um, shenanigans. So if he did like crackle, crackle, lightning bolt, and I was on 17 life, he could kill me. Um, trading the minion is fine because it's a one game anyway. Now at this point I actually learned to count, and yeah, I realized, oh, I've got lethal. Although I did have it two, get two turns back. But yeah, so you can miss lethal with this deck and still just hard counter aggro shaman. Even if the guy had gone full full aggressive, um, we probably just had him outright beat. Although it is worth noting we didn't draw into our healing, so he could have had more of a chance. Okay, so now we go into the next game. Now this is a really interesting one. Um, without spoiling it, this is an interesting game, and also this is going to be the last game. I'm going to cut off the uh, matchup after this. Um, just because I'm feeling a little bit ill, and I've done this voiceover twice now, so it's kind of affected me a little bit. So, what I do here is I keep the Fan of Knives, because it's a Paladin, you always hard mulligan Fan of Knives. And because I'm going second, I decided to keep the Sabotage. Um, for whatever reason, I just kind of sensed... Like, I don't know, sometimes you just kind of, you feel that you might be running into a slightly slower Secret Paladin. I always assume it is Secret Paladin. But for whatever reason, I figured it would get a slow list. I don't know why I felt that, so I figured if I keep the Sabotage, I can kill the Tyrion. Um, most lists these days are favouring slower variants, which was probably my line of thought with the Mulligan there. Um, so there are some lists which don't run Tyrion still, but frankly, I think if you're making Secret Pally, you have to have Tyrion in there. The reason why I coined the SI out is I just wanted to deal with the Divine Shield. I'm always overly afraid of buffs in that deck, so I just didn't want anything bad to happen. Um, I do a kind of interesting play here. I could have gone face, and said I decided to hit the 2-1. The reason why I decided to hit the 2-1 is I just want to be make sure I can definitely kill it. Um, I figured he would probably trade this way anyway, but I don't really care about getting that one face damage in. Because I don't really care about getting the one face damage, I just want to secure board trades and promote his trading. Um, playing this on curve is fine here, I get a little miniature heal, doesn't heal him for anything, it deals with his board quite well, he needs to use like buffs and stuff to get through it, otherwise I 2 for 1. He drops down a low feb, who cares. Now the dream here is the perfect curve and I decide to just play a Sarad on curve here. Now you're kind of going, well you're not going to get any value out of it, why are you just going to throw it down on curve? I have the fan of knives in hand. I'm running double Dark Eye on Skulker. I don't need to be overly greedy with my fans. Because of that, I just want him to trade. I just really want him to trade. He trades the 5-5 five five into the 4-5. Anyone who doesn't make that trade is misplaying. Um, and that way I can do my 3-2 into his 4-3. Fan of Knives, maybe he plays quarter, and you know I just solve win. Now, it, my strategy doesn't quite work as planned, but it still ends up paying off. So he ends up flooding the board. I get really unlucky with knife juggles here, and I start raging a little bit, but it's fine. He then decides to hit that because he's feeling super lucky. Like, that is one of the most risky plays I've ever seen. Because of that, I'm able to get value. Um, I still get to make the trades I wanted to make. If he had gotten the juggling dream, I would have been in a very bad place. But, I mean, come on. So, I end up picking up a Ice Barrier, which is a very handy spell in this case. 
you can't always plan around getting um, healing, but it's quite often you'll either get kind of like half of a combo. Combos generally, um, the way I think of spells in general in this game is I think of them as either defensive or offensive. There are some other like fluffy spells which do card draw or burgle or thought seal, but in general they have like an offensive or a defensive variant. Having extra offensive or defensive options is always great. I decide to just play on curve. Yeah, okay, I could have maybe died to a double kings, but him having double kings in the top, um, well, more than top half, top 19 cards of his deck is really low. That BGH I don't really mind so much because I run Ragnaros and I have him uh, potentially be able to play next turn. I get kind of lucky there, I get to snipe that off. And he goes for the trade. I got pretty lucky with my Boombox clearing the board quite nicely for me. Um, now, you could say, oh, this is the easiest play in the game. We just slam down that rag. I decided not to. I was still afraid of maybe getting double kings. He didn't have that last turn, but even one king would be pretty scary. Playing a rag and killing a 1-1 one -one isn't very powerful. It would most likely just hit two 1-1s. One uh, even if it went face, it wouldn't be that powerful because I'm very much on the back foot, so the face damage would be the best case for him. Basically, just, I don't win by playing Rag in any case, so holding off works out for me quite well, because as you can see, um, he could have Keeper of Aldermond it. Now, at this point, I kind of start to question his list a little bit. I think, hang on, Keeper of Aldermond, Parted Shredder, BGH, Aldor. Maybe this is Reno, because I haven't seen any duplicates, and I'm feeling, why hasn't he played a um, Must of Battle at this point? Like, has he really drawn that slow? Um, he got a really nice curve this game, but I'm kind of like, why haven't I seen it yet? So, I this point I start playing around an uh, even slower list, um, and as you'll see ahead if I'm right or wrong, but that was kind of my thought process. Now, this is where I definitely realise, okay, this is definitely not Secret Paladin. Um, the fact that he has that many cards in hands and just hear a power past is like, what's that about? So this is kind of when I start turning the game around and suddenly I'm becoming the heavy aggressor and I just start punching him in the face. This is how most matchups go, is you either do one of two things. You either start off with a very strong curve, in which case you are the aggressor and you try and maintain that position, or you start off with a slightly slower curve and then you win back, you stabilize, and then you become aggressive. If you're on the back foot the entire game, beginning to end, you've probably lost. With this deck, you should at some point always be able to make some kind of swing and become the aggressor or you stabilize and grind them out. But like, do you know what I'm saying? You're never always behind. Even in the stabilization case, if you've stabilized, you're no longer behind, you're stable. That's why I use that term. Um, here I decide to trade the way I did because I want to keep as much on the board as possible. I'm also expecting one kings in his list. I don't want him to kings the Reno and kill my rag. I was overly afraid of that, but you know, it's kind of fine. So here you can see I drew into my double BGH and I haven't got to use them yet. Having the fast here would have been kind of nice. I would have just been able to play up on mana, you know, on curve. He got the little extra healing here. Kind of a big deal, but ultimately not really. He plays his master for battle. Now the Skulker's looking very, very nice. Now, you know, again, you could say, oh, maybe that'd be a burgle. You can't really think that way. So we Skulker. We set up an amazingly beautiful trade for us. We can now go face, we can now do the hero power, Finley. Because I realise he's a slower list and he's used his one must for the battle, I'm not too worried about keeping the hero power. Here I just go for the most defensive option possible, which is the priest. Again, I'm just punching face. At this point I'm like, okay, I've won this game, he's going to concede. Um, he's played through Reno, he's played through his uh, Tusker, you know, he, he might at best have a heal bot. I've won this game. But, oh, he plays a uh, threat. Hmm. He plays a threat and he floods the board. Well, no worries, I'm running double big game hunter. And my beautiful uh, Nexus champion, Ice Barrow, just propped. And I love that animation, by the way. Really, really nice. So I'm kind of like, okay, it's quite clear here. Um, I could potentially have a lethal. Um, if you add up my damages, I have six damage from the Finley, the 4 3, and the dagger. Uh, with Ragnaros hitting face. So at this point I'm just trying to work out what is the best way of clearing as much of the board as possible to increase the chance of Rag hitting face. 
The problem with Rag, and this is the one issue with Rag, and this is why being able to silence Rag in your own deck is sometimes quite nice. So if you run one silence, silence is nearly always good. You silence your own Rag, and you remove these situations. Now, the reason why I mention the silence here is the faster slot is the slot which I tinker with when adding stuff like Mind Control Tech, Owl, or second BGH. Um, I like being able to play on curve the 3 3 body, so I feel like MCT faster is more reliable than going for the second PGH with the owl option. But if I had to run owl in this one particular game, it would have, you know, won the game slightly earlier. But I mean, seriously, looking at the board, I'm kind of like, okay, well, I've got him next turn, right? Like, there's no way he could possibly live this turn, yeah? There's like no, no way he could live this turn. Maybe. Sort of. Potentially. Who knows? Well, I know, because I played the game, but anyway. So he consecrates. Okay. Because at this point, the reason why he makes that trade rather than the boom bot is he figures that, well, he's already dead if Ragnaros goes face. So being at 7 life or 8 life doesn't really matter. Here I've got a few interesting options. I could sabotage to try and um, increase my chance of getting lethal. I tried working out the maths of him getting a 4 drop with only 2 health. As far as I'm aware off the top of my head, there is only the stealth um, spell damage mage. So, you know, doing the sabotage skulker dream probably just sets him up way too much. Okay, again, he's kind of like, he's still sort of in there. He's, this guy does an amazing job of sort of just staying in there. But he isn't stabilizing by any stretch. He's just sort of dragging the game on. But I respect him for, you know, lasting as long as he did. So he then drops the sludge. I'm kind of like, okay, well, now, like now, surely we're going to get there, right? And he owls the rag. I was incredibly surprised by this play. Like, very, very surprised. Um, I guess he was very overly confident that his sludge would stick for multiple turns and be able to stabilize. Here I draw into the burgle. Because I didn't have leaf on board, I always burgle in that kind of scenario. Because like, oh, I might get reach, I might get an equality, I might get quality consecrate. Um, you know, what might I get? And I'm getting a pretty good hand. I get overly greedy with the redemption here. Um, I figure, okay, this redemption, I have to make this play. Like, there's no way I don't make this play. This play is amazing. I probably could have just healed. Um, but then if you heal the rag, you buff the holy champion to a 5 attack. Yeah, okay, your rag will be at 6 attack, but you buff that to 5. Maybe you can do something. Maybe you can get that 1 damage from somewhere. So I just kind of went for this play. Um, it is what it is. So at this point, I'm like, well, he's either he's going to kill the rag and the rag's going to resurrect. Or he's going to kill the 4-3. The 4-3 resurrects, and I definitely have lethal after that. Like, there's no way he can possibly... Oh, he runs a cold camera. Okay. So he manages to stall again. The redemption procs, I get that back. So now I'm kind of like, oh, I wish I had that dagger. But still, like, we got so much value out of the healing. Like, it secured the game. It kept us high health. It was chill. So now here's the Toshley. This would have been a Sylvanas. I'm like, okay. Toshley, help me out. Help out a bra. So, I'm kind of thinking, okay, what's the options here? Will I sabotage? No. Um, I did a big, big misplay here because, again, I was focusing on the commentary. I figured, okay, I'll do Toshley Sabotage, it will maybe clear the taunt, um, and I can get the game. Because I was focusing on the commentary, I didn't focus on my ordering, so I ended up sabotaging first, which is wrong. The reason why you always sabotage seconds, I would have also destroyed the weapon. Again, I'm not worried about losing this game, but that was still a misplay. Um, and potentially, if he did shenanigans, that could have cost me. Potentially. So here the Toshley sets up a kind of nice little play, um, where, well, you can see the play. With the reversing switch and the second BGH, I can snipe it. I can flip the attack and just snipe it down, no problem. Uh, playing down the sludge here, a-okay. Uh, the reason why I play the sludge rather than healing the Ragnaros up is I just wanted to secure a board. If he did get an equality consecrate or some kind of full clear, I would still have the um, one damage to chip into face or he would have to trade into. And here we go. Here we finally, finally get the elusive, elusive win. Now, 
but there is one more game but I'm gonna cut it here because as I said my throat so one thing I'm, a few things I'm gonna quickly say um, apologies for again the very slap slap dash nature of this video um, again the tech choices that I changed with just one last time to reiterate I dropped Sylvanas for Toshley I dropped one Burgle for a Dark, I Dark Iron Skulker and I dropped one Farseer for a second BGH. I'm going to stick with Farseer for now. If Warlock becomes overly prevalent on ladder and that is Handlock, swap the Farseer to a second BGH. Anyway, I'm Taki Cat. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this uh, video has given you a little more insight um, on how this deck operates and you know, hopefully it was at least fun. I hope everyone has a really great new year. Thanks. Bye-bye.